there are a lot of programs, uh, initiatives, institutions, and activities in our community, and they have been in existence for quite some time. However, we're going to discuss today one of the most important elements and institutions and programs in our community, which is education, public education. And then I don't think anybody will argue with me when I say, as public education goes, so goes the community. So I'm happy today to have with me uh, the superintendent of Bibb County Schools, Dr. Curtis Jones. And we're going to talk about several important factors as it relates to education. First of all, Doc, I want to congratulate you for the hard work you've done or doing. I want to congratulate you for the progress that the school system has made. And as a citizen and, and as a businessman, I realize the role that education plays in all of the facets of our community. So you're doing a great job and uh, just keep it up. And uh, I, as a citizen want to, and a businessman, I want to personally thank you. Well, thank you for letting me be on the show again. I love coming to a call for action or call to action. And I also want to thank you for continuing to be a part of our business education partnership. Our teachers and staff have worked very, very hard over the past five years. They've done a great job. And I thank you for publicly acknowledging that. Um, that pat on the back will go a long way to keep them going forward. So thank you very much. I started to tell them that I used to be a school teacher, Doc, but I always <laughs> tell that story. But I mean, that, 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 that's the source of my belief in the public education system. What you see is what you get, Doc. You know, I uh, went to public school, taught in the public school system here. So I'm a firm and a strong believer in public education. And I know how advantageous it is and can be and how important it is. But let's talk a little bit about you. Yeah, but you are a role model, though. And you need to remember that because young people can learn from you. They go to school. A lot of times they question why they're going, what's it about? But when you can take what you do and make a living doing it and make a difference where you are, you're a hero. And so I want to thank you for what you're doing and continue to come into our schools and talk to these young folks. They need to hear from us folks that got a little bit of gray on top. Let's head way into, uh, and we can get more information on you as we go, about how the community, you talked about how important that is to have community individuals and community elements, if you please. Yep involved in education. Talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, uh, truthfully, I have good teachers, good administrators, but what makes us, our system different than others are the students who come through the door. And the more supportive they are, the better they're going to be prepared to go to school when they enter first grade so they can get out of third grade reading on grade level. And so this community has been exceptional. I'm going to be quite honest. Uh, when I got here in 2015, we had to raise the millage rate because our budget was underwater. And the community did it without a fuss. And a lot of times, you talk about that increase in taxes, they're going to get mad. We also had to, at the same time, almost pass the East Floss. So we were able to continue to renovate our schools. And we have done a great job of that. We have the new Northeast High School that's just been finished a year ago. We have the new Appling Middle School that's now on the same campus with the high school, and it is a fantastic looking example. And my Board of Education just made me so happy recently where we built a new elementary school and named it after John Lewis. I mean, what else can you have? Macon Bibb has a Martin Luther King and a John Lewis elementary school. Mm -hmm. And so we can't do that without the community. And we have so many mentors who come into our schools helping our students learn to read that it is amazing. I tell that story no matter where I go across the country. So we can't do it by ourselves. We need parents to send kids to school ready to learn, dressed, having slept, and ready to uh, go home and do some homework. So we, we've been fortunate. I've been very, very pleased with our community support. Yes, for those who don't know, this is a call to action. A call to action. I'm your host, Alex Haversham. And as I said, interviewing uh, Dr. Uh, Chris Jones, Superintendent 
or Bibb County School. Now, let me say this very quickly, though. There is, you know, except for spiritually, there is no more important element or institution or organization that you can support because public education uh, involves everything. It affects yeah. everything. It affects crime. It affects the economy. It affects the quality of life. It affects moving the town, people moving the town. It affects the tax base. It affects the good feelings that we have, you know, behavior, everything, everything. Public education plays a major role in that. So how can one become involved? It's the same thing that goes with the church. You got the three T's, times, tides, and talents. And so we've talked a little bit about time where individuals are able to come in and volunteer. We continue to have a great need for mentors. If you just want to come and mentor an elementary student and give them just somebody to talk to at lunchtime, come in and read to them or let them read to you. It is amazing. They love to show what they've learned and they like having that conversation. The older students need to be able to see how what they do relates to the real world. So that time is important. When we talk about your talents, tell us, come in and, and do some guest talks with our students. Tell them about your career, about your struggles. Because a lot of times they think what they're going through, they're the very first ones to have to do it. And they have to recognize <laughs> they weren't the first and they won't be the last. But they can make it if we share that time and, and, and share our talents for what we did to make that work. And then the other part, quite honestly, is money. I mean, I'm not going to call it tides, but for example, we're going through COVID-19. We have a lot of students in poverty. They need to be able to get devices. That costs money. They got to be able to get on the internet. That costs money. Sometimes they got to have decent clothes. We have students who sometimes come in dirty clothes and we have to wash them. So schools have to buy washing machines, you mm -hmm. know, and truthfully, I'll be honest, our budget is not so big that you can just buy all that and give them a winter coat or whatever it is they may need. So once you create that relationship, time, talents are, are the key things that we need. And without belaboring it now, how can, is that, how can one become involved? I mean, we don't have to talk about all the, the, the processes of being involved. Is there a central number or uh, something if, that one can call? You can go on our website, and, which is uh, bcsdk12.net, and find Dr. Lori Rogers. Lori Rogers is in charge of our uh, federal programs. She also supervises our parental support. She will be able to help us get into that process of letting you become a volunteer to help us out. If you don't want to do that one, just call the 8501 number. Tell the operator you just want to volunteer the switchboard to get you to where you need to be. Absolutely. We make it easy. Okay, well, I mean, this year, you know, I've heard a lot of comments about 2020. Some people say they so, they'll be mighty glad to see it go. Some people say it has been the most uh, notable year of their lives. And so, I mean, it has been a real challenge for all of us. And then when you've got a school system with how many, what, 25,000? Uh, we're at 23, sir, 23,000. students in it, you know, K through 12 or whatever, you know, I'm sure. And with COVID and this impact and this spread and this situation in Georgia, I, I'm sure that's a mountain to climb, man, trying to, trying to deal with that. So tell me how you're handling that as it relates to, uh, safety as it relates to schools opening as it relates to instruction just look okay. at hey, well, i appreciate that uh, where we at with education where <laughs> we at? i will do that <laughs> uh, i want to commend you again though not many people know how many kids we have your twenty-five thousand is what we had before we lost the students who went to ace ace took about two thousand students with them and so that's how we kind of dropped down to 23 and that's pre-k through 12th grade okay. uh, so where are we well, first of all, you know, we started last March and we had to go through the process of shutting the system down. We looked at the spread of COVID-19 and I'll be honest, we worked with the North Central Health District, the governor's office, the st uh, state school superintendent's office, and I read as much as I could to make sure that I knew what was happening. We had to struggle with a couple of things. We had to figure out how to feed our kids. We had to figure out how to give them online instruction. We had to issue a whole bunch of devices. And so it was like, where are we? So we got through that last year. And it's important people recognize that last spring, it was about students not having their grades fall, but they could improve their grades. 
Now we're in a different place. We're in the beginning of a new year. We have new curriculum, new tasks, new courses that students have to master. So we're in the process now of starting a new school on, on September 8th. And we're looking forward to seeing all 23,000 kids come. We're gonna be starting virtually. And what we have done since uh, school was out is we have been having our teachers go through a whole month of August for professional learning. We put in place a new program called Canvas, which is a learning management system. So all those parents who said last year it was hard, uh, they had elementary kids that got paper packets and they couldn't turn them back in, you don't have to worry about that now. Everything's gonna be online, it's electronic. And you don't have to worry about pre-K kids either. You know why? We issue iPads or laptops to all of our students pre-K through first grade, they got iPads. Second grade through 12th grade, they got laptops. And those who said they were not able to get to the internet, we issued a thing called hotspots. Last spring, we gave out over a thousand to high school students. Last week, we gave out another thousand to students in first grade through eighth grade. One hotspot will let you link in or put on the internet up to 12 devices. We recommend you don't really put more than four on that little small hotspot, but if a household has two kids, one hotspot's enough. And so our staff has been working extremely hard to get those two things in place. And I'm very excited about that process. Okay, that's outstanding now. But if, 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 if a family already has a hotspot, Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a while that's in the home, then yep. there's no need. There's no need to do that. All they need to do is make sure that if they're using Cox or whatever, that they're able to link into our system. So between now and Tuesday, what I'm asking is that parents go to their school's webpage, look at the open house videos that have been created, sign into our learning management system called Canvas, and make sure that it all works. If it doesn't, give us a call so we're able to help you work through it. Because starting Tuesday, kids are gonna be in school and it's not gonna be, I give you an assignment and I'll see you on Friday. I mean, it's, they're gonna be checking in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. You're saying that there will be actual electronic virtual instruction. These teachers know, are, we are light years ahead of where we were last year. Yeah. So you will have some live teaching where kids are going to have a certain time where they have to be online with the teacher and next week it's important and we're taking attendance so you know it's got to be live if we're taking attendance and we're going to be using that to verify uh, that students are online and learning and so we're very excited about how this new process is going to work for us now what would be your advice doc to parents you know because it's extremely important you know i've heard all kind of well, I don't want to call them excuses, but whatever, as it relates to the difficulty. And, you know, we all realize, you know, that they're already losing something. You know, we all realize the importance of in-person, but this, it is what it is for right now. So what would be your advice to the parents to make sure that to the extent possible, that young man or that young woman or that child uh, gets the, the the full value, the full benefit of that virtual experience in, in school? There's several things. One, I would ask that parents um, make sure they're comfortable with whoever's going to be supervising their child. They need to have that peace of mind. They also need to call back and check in on their children throughout the day to make sure they didn't go do something. I don't have teachers who are standing over them at this one point in time. When the parent gets home from work, they will now be able to go back online and look and see what work the child was supposed to do. Wow. They can go into the parent portal and be able to see what assignment has been offered. And again, we have a new program called Remind. So if the parent has a question, they'll be able to directly contact the teachers. Teachers will now be able to use their personal cell phones to talk to parents, but it won't give the teachers private number. But you know how often parents would say the school never called me? This Remind program is gonna track who calls whom and how long that conversation lasted so we don't have those issues. A lot of people say that when you work from home, you get to do it in your pajamas. You want to lay in bed. 
Kids don't need to have on pajamas to be laying in bed trying to go to school. They need to dress just like they're going to school, just like when you're working from home, you need to dress like you're going to work. It changes your mindset, it gives you the right attitude, and it puts you in the frame of reference. Second thing, give them a dedicated place to work. It doesn't need to be in the bed again, because if it's in the bed, you're gonna to go to sleep. It doesn't need to be with the TV on, it needs to be off. And so give them as best you can a work area, whether it's in the dining room area or the kitchen or wherever, so they have a place where they know this is where I'm supposed to be doing school. And I think when the parent and the student come to that mindset, we're gonna be good. Another thing, we've talked about students have to eat. And so there are two things that students can do. One is they can sign up for meals every day for the food that they want to get the next day. That would be for breakfast and lunch. They can also sign up for the week. We have go to our website, you're able to sign up. And when you sign up for it, tell us where you want to pick it up. Two options. One option is to go to the school at curbside service and pick up the two meals for that day. Or if you ride a bus, go to your bus stop. At your bus stop, you're able to meet the bus because you've already told us how many meals that you wanted a meal, we'll give you your two meals. Now you gotta know your student ID number because we gotta count for the meals. But once you tell us you're signing up for it, we will have it prepared. And so the statement is, so parents know what time the bus is supposed to get there. So we have the My Stop by My Bus app. So they're able to use that know what time the bus should be there so kids don't have to be out for 20 minutes 30 minutes they can walk out for about five minutes before the bus gets there see the bus get it and go back home the parent can tell what time the bus is supposed to be there using the my stop app they'll be able to know they see the bus in live time with gps so there's all right i see the bus is about five minutes away go on out there and get your food call me when you get back that way we won't have kids messing around and we can make sure they're safe um, those are some things that I can think of that will help us. Now, what about the, what about people or parents? You know, and I think this is important, and I, I've got a couple of ideas, who are not that savvy as it relates to technology and the Internet. Is there a, a system or a process or a program in place? We got you covered. We got you covered. That new program that we call you Canvas. Like the, you like the morning do, man. <laughs> oh, I'm feeling, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm feeling good about the progress that we've made. So I told you a couple of times now about our new learning management system called Canvas. What will happen now is a, a kindergartner will open up their iPad and they're gonna go to their opening page called Class Link. And on Class Link, there are gonna be a bunch of icons. They'll be able to click on their teacher's classroom and then it will open up a new page and then they can pick on math or reading or whatever and it will take them directly to where they have to go. And so we're doing all we can to take all the complications out. Just It's, it's just like when you go to college. It's just click, click, click uh, is the way it ought to be. But remember what I said earlier, go use Canvas now before Tuesday so you know it works and because you got to go through a little bit of setup. Now we've already made sure that the hotspots we passed out were good. We've already made sure the laptops that we gave and iPads were working. Uh, and so we are confident on our end. We did a, what we call the stress test. We had all our teachers get online. We had every computer turned on and they were projecting just like they were teaching their class. So we're kind of like cops, we can get it out. The question is, can you bring it in once it gets to your house? That's what needs to be worked through, and we're going to work on that. So the kids have been using uh, Teams from last spring, so they know a little bit about it. But, you know, I guess I'm going to say if it's still complicated for a grandparent or a great-grandparent, my the, uh, the Remind app, just get on the phone, call the school, tell them what your problem is, and we will talk you through it because it's to our advantage to get this worked out during the first week of school than it is to let it drag on and on and on. Because I can't tell you when we're gonna go back to in-person instruction yet. Yeah, I was gonna ask you that. I didn't know whether there was any kind of projection as it relates. Uh, you know, the projection I have is a lot of people around me are starting to do it, uh, go back to in-person. And when I look at the COVID-19 situation, I ask myself, how can they do that? I mean, I, I've shared a little bit, but 
I look at two factors. I want to know how many cases per 100,000 people uh, have captured COVID over the last two weeks. I, there's a, a newsletter that comes out from a professor at Mercer that I look at that talks about Georgia. Sometimes she talks specifically about Bib and the United States. That's one. I use another weekly summary that comes out from the North Central Health District that tells me what those numbers are. And as you know, the governor's office also puts out information through the Department of uh, Public Health. All three of those, I look to see if they're telling me. If we have more than 100 cases per 100, more than 100 cases per 100,000 people, we're in what they call significant spread. And we have been in significant spread since March. Our numbers, so that number 100, when we decided to, that we would do virtual, we were six times the number wow. for community spread to be significant, six times. Right now, we're three times the number when I just checked this week. And so we have to do a lot more of wearing masks, socially distancing, washing our hands, and making sure that we don't give it to other people. Uh, the only way I'm gonna be able to get kids back in school is I feel confident that putting them in school will be safe. Uh, and right now, the spread in the community is just too high. You know, a lot of people want to say, oh, that's happening in the hospital or that's happening in a, a senior home. In Bibb County right now, when we made our decision, the community spread where they can't relate it to individual place was over 90%. Over 90% means it's just out there in different places and you can't say, I won't go there. Guys, it's everywhere you go. You don't know where it is. That's right. You don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I'm glad you said that. Uh... Doc, and I, I wish you would repeat it because uh, what you are saying is the community's responsibility as it relates to helping to prevent this disease. And there are certain steps that we all can take. We want a chance to get our, our CCRPI above 70. Uh, we want a chance to get our graduation rate above 80. And so as long as we got this process going on, is making it more difficult for us. I am thankful to the daycares and the churches that are helping us because while some parents have to go to work and leave children, some of those facilities are saying, we will take these children on and we're gonna provide daycare for them. And they're letting them get on their Wi-Fi so they'll be able to um, get to the curriculum that they need. That has been great. I'm also very thankful to the county government for what they've been doing. We have been working together. And what that means is we know what the requirements are for wearing masks. We know it's important to socially distance. We know it's important not to get into large groups. And so we've been consistent with that. I'm going to be honest. My teachers were very, very nervous in August when I said, it's time for y'all to come back to work. I need you in the buildings because they saw what the numbers were like everybody else. And so the community, though, started getting the numbers down. We sanitize our classrooms, for example, now twice a week. Uh, we, have, we have gloves, we have masks. I mean, I got, I got masks out to Wazoo uh, where, we, where we're just trying to make sure everybody's ready. I got a mask from Burdell Hunt. I got a mask that says VIP. I got a mask from Ingram Pie. I got a mask from Rutland. I have a mask uh, from Hutchins College and Career Academy. Oh, wow. Uh, we believe in wearing masks and socially distancing because that's how we're going to get kids back in school. And young people have to recognize that over the last three weeks, the age group from, uh, I think it was like 14 through 35 are the ones who are getting COVID the most because they're out there. Colleges have opened back up. Schools have opened back up. Sports are now back in session again. Uh, you're getting more close contact. And it's almost like we're back to normal but COVID-19 is still here. Personally encourage, you know, the students, and I want to thank the teachers and the administrative staff and all the support staff. And it's very, very confident, dog, that, uh, that you all have gone through all these changes, all these changes, all these adjustments and all of these modifications so you can continue to provide the kind of quality education that the school system is designed to do and effectuate the kind of change in behavior that uh, you would want to see. One of the reasons we can do it is because we listen to you. And somebody gave me the last time I was on this show a call to action. 
and I knew we had to go out and produce. Yeah. Our staff is working hard, and uh, I want to thank the parents who've left their students with us. We have had a reduction of about, I'm going to say, 50 children where they have left us to go to another place where uh, they, the parent couldn't provide the daycare and couldn't figure it out. Uh, but for those who are going to be with us, they're going to be impressed, I really do believe. Uh, we have our one-to-one -one initiative so that by the end of October, first part of November, students are going to be getting new devices that are going to have more speed, more memory, that's going to even make it even better. I mean, we are just in a much better place than where we were. So I'm excited for the work we're doing. Principals and teachers have been doing a great job. Board of Education has been very supportive. Um, it, it has been good. So I thank you. And uh, when you give us the, the next call to action, I'm going to let, make sure my teachers and staff hear you and we follow through. Hey, man, you, you made a lot of progress. And then give that website again. So you can go to www.bcsdk12.net. The phone number, just in case somebody wants to call the board. 478-765-8507. Now, one other question before you leave. So you're saying that everybody will have access to that information technologically. They should. And so I will go ahead and say this publicly. If a person says they cannot get to the internet or they don't have a device, in some cases they don't want to get to the internet or they don't want a device because we're doing all we can. We have issued right now over 13,000 devices. We have 23,000 kids. And we've also now issued almost 1,700 hotspots and we have more. So they need to come let us. And here's the other thing, we didn't mention this, we now got a virtual school going, VIP Academy. Uh, Dr. Julia Danley over at SOAR Academy is now taking students from elementary through high school for who just wanna learn remotely. And uh, she's helping them, it's primarily aimed at people who are homeschool uh, or private school. And uh, we're gonna be using the Edgenuity curriculum. We're very excited about that too. So we're, we're making some changes, sir. We're making some changes. The other way to stay informed is to maybe call a number and try to get the newsletter and the, the board brief. Yep. So if you really want to help keep up with what's going on, then you can call. I mean, I know there's a process where you can call or go to the website. All, all they have to do is go onto the website. You can click on our Let's Talk button. Tell us that you would like to get the newsletter. Give us your name, your email address and we'll start sending it to you. Having gotten a truckload of information about education that's going to begin on September 8th, it's school time. It is school you know, time. And uh, Dr. Jones and his staff, you know, have done a phenomenal job. And let me tell you something. This is my advice to the parents and the students. This is one of the best things. Look, look, a good education is better than apple pie because it's going to get put a sweet taste in your mouth for the rest of your life. So for parents and kids and everybody, do, do what you're supposed to do to get educated because Doc has given all the resources. He got all kinds of help for everybody. This is a call to action. A call to action. I'm your host, Alex Taffersham. Have an interview, Dr. Curtis Jones, superintendent of the Bibb County Board of Education. Have a learned day.